Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Bayside. My name is Mark. We are, uh, we're glad you're with us this morning. Um, we got a special, special way we're going to start things this morning. We got a, a baby dedication. Not just one, not just two. We got three babies today that we are going to dedicate. Three children. Um, so if, if the Johnsons and the Kurskas want to come on up, um, just, just come right up on here. There you go. Um, you know, this, this kind of this tradition, I guess, or this thinking of, ba- of, of dedication comes from Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was getting prepared to be, to be dedicated. And um, it says in Luke 2, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that's Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, presenting the child to the Lord, as is written in the law of Moses. And, and so that's what we do. We, we take these beautiful little kids and, and, and we dedicate them. Um, and, and really what we're doing is, is this time of dedication is, it's a three-way dedication. Number one, we're dedicating um, the child to the Lord. And, and so we're, we're, we're lifting up that child and saying, God, as you have given this child um, we now give it back to you. And, and as the Lord has given, we dedicate this child to you and your service. And then we're dedicating the parents. And, and we're saying that they will now raise this child, these children, in the ways of the Lord. And, and so we dedicate the child, we dedicate the parents, and then you all are a part of this dedication because we can't do this, a parent can't do this totally on their own. They're going to need some help and need some Sunday school teachers and need some, some other adults who can encourage their children kind of along the way. And, and as a parent, I know how important that is to have other adults in these kids' lives who can kind of lead them and, and guide them in that. And so anyway, we have Andrew here, Andrew Kurska. And uh, what a handsome little guy. You can't see him. Maybe we have a picture I don't know if we have a picture of him. We'll see. There he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that awesome? Um, so we're going to dedicate little Andrew, and special for us, our first is also named Andrew, so great little boy here. Um, so we're going to dedicate him, and then we're going to dedicate Jasmine and Colton. And um, two beautiful, beautiful, there they are. Yeah, they were in my office this week playing Legos, right? Yeah, it was awesome. They didn't, they didn't take care, we'll, we'll get to that. But, but, but it was wonderful to meet them. And of course, of course, Colton has had quite a life. And um, all children are a gift, amen? They're a gift from the Lord. You are all kids, so you better say amen. <laughs> right? Yeah, so these are beautiful children. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're just going to pray um, one blessing over, over these three kids that are going to be dedicated here today. And again, they are being dedicated to the Lord. The parents are being dedicated. You guys have to realize now you're being, you're being sort of set aside to raise these kids in the ways of the Lord. And then you all are going to be a part of that to do whatever it is you can do to encourage these children as a community in the ways of the Lord. So why don't you stand with us, okay? Let's stand and let's just pray for Andrew and for Jasmine and for Colton. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do come to you today with gratefulness and thankfulness in our hearts. Children are a gift. God, they are a gift from you. And we just praise and thank you for these three beautiful children that we are dedicated, and, th- and these families as well, God, that are up here in support. And Father, we pray that, that you would take these children and, and you, would, you would use them, God, for your glory, that they would have a wonderful purpose, an amazing reason, God, that they are on this earth, and, and hopefully that part of that is to bring you glory in their life. And so we pray for that. God, we ask that they would learn about you at a young age, that they would, they would see your beauty and your glory, God, even while they're still young, and that they would realize that they need to trust in you, that they need to rely upon you, Jesus, and what you did. And we pray for these three beautiful children that they would do that at a young age. We also, God, lift these parents up to you. And again, we're thankful that they have wanted, desired to dedicate their kids. And, and we pray that, that they would raise these children, God, in the ways of the Lord. That they would, that they would be looking into your word as, as the outline, as how to best raise their kids, God. Because you've certainly given us 
given us the, the plan for raising children. And so I pray that they would do that according to your word, that they would stay connected into a community of believers for help and support. And so then, God, we also dedicate ourselves as the body, as this community, God, that we can do whatever we can do to help, to support them, to encourage these children as they start living out, walking out their salvation, God, as they have trusted in you. So we, we do lift all of, them, all of them up to you. We thank you again for these beautiful kids, and we just pray your blessing upon them, their families, upon all of us as we help in the process. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your ultimate gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Can you give these beautiful families a little round of applause? Congratulations. Congratulations. You may be seated. Congratulations. There. Congratulations. You guys can sit down. Hi. Blessings to you and to you, sweetie. Congrats. Yep. We'll have certificates for both of you all soon. Again, welcome. We are glad that you're with us at Bayside. We started last week in a series. Um, it was entitled, The Glory of One. And what we're looking at, we are looking at how we can bring our God glory based upon how we interact with each other and how we relate to each other as one body and how that brings our God incredible pleasure and honor and glory. And so we are looking at that. And last week we talked about how we are like living stones. Living stones built into an actual uh, temple for the Lord. And we did some Lego building last Sunday morning. And we built a Lego house. And, and everybody got a Lego who was here. If you weren't here, yeah, there we got some pictures. Everybody kind of came at the end of the service. And, and we took our Lego piece and, and we started to build this this house, this temple for the Lord. There's the finished product, and there's the finished product. And um, I, I want to encourage you, if, if you weren't here last week, um, come on forward at the end of the service. We had a lot of people do this after first service, and, and, and they put their Lego piece, uh, there we got some extra Lego pieces, and they continued to build this house. Um, this house, this temple, this spiritual dwelling place for God, it's not done. It's continuing to grow and to be built. So I want to encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to do that last week, come on forward. A um, couple of kind of neat stories from last week. First of all, we had in the first service a young guy. He was a visitor. It was his only week he was here. He was from out of town with his family. But I said, you know, what's that big piece in the corner? What's that big corner piece? And he raised, he raised his hand. He said, that's Jesus. That's the cornerstone. And, and I talked to him after, and he was just beaming with pride because of the fact that he knew that the cornerstone of any true spiritual dwelling has to be Christ himself. And then I had a guy come up to me and, and sort of after the service when everybody was putting their brick on and, and he said, I kind of thought about it and, and he said, I want you to, to take my, my Lego brick. And, and, and I said, okay, why? He said, well, you know, I really feel like I'm here to serve. I don't know where I fit yet. But how about if you put my Lego piece where you think it'll go best? And I thought that's kind of a neat picture of just coming in and saying, I'm just going to serve. And then I just talked to a gal just this morning after first service. And she said, I, I have to tell you that while you were sharing that message on this spiritual house, she said, there were tears in my eyes the whole time. And, and I said, why? She said, well, I, I was at a church before this and I was hurt. And, and when you told us to come and put our Lego piece on that house, I said, no way. I'm not going to do it. I'll be a part of your body, Christ, but I will not be a part of this body because I don't think I trust them. I don't know if I trust them. And she had a, a friend of hers that came up and, and kind of knew what she was dealing with and saw the tears and she sat down next to her and she put her arm around her and she said, you know, I think let's maybe go do this together. And so they came down together and, and put their, their bricks on. Um, and, and I understand that. I understand. I, I said last week, so many of us are coming from so many different places. And some of those places are places of hurts or wounds. Like we had a whole series talking about some of those past things that can happen to us. And sometimes, you know, the picture is we are joined together. And that word means a close proximity 
to one another. And sometimes the thought of that when we've been wounded can, can make us think, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready to, to join with these other imperfect people. You know, you can kind of see it on this picture, but there are teeth marks all over these Legos. And, and I said that came from Lego that way. But, but, you know, we are all different. And some of us have wounds and, and scars that are, that are, that are apparent. And, and that you can still see and that you can still feel. You know, there's a picture, though, of, of unity amidst incredible diversity even among people who are wounded and who are hurting. And so what I want to encourage you with is, is if you weren't here last Sunday morning, after the service, come on forward, grab your little Lego out of there and place it, place it right on this building because we're still growing. Might be a step of faith for you. That's okay. That's okay. We all have steps of faith at times. But come on forward and, and keep on building this church. So that was last week. Sort of a, the picture, the analogy was a spiritual house. Today we're going to look at a different aspect of how the church works as one. Um, I want to bring you back to the Garden of Eden. We started there last week as well. And just picture, imagine for a moment, God just finishes creating the world. And, and when he got done with every component, he said something. He said, he saw what he had created and he saw that it was what? It was good. And so God built this perfectly good world, this earth and all of its green beauty and the mountains and the oceans and the trees and the plants and, and the fruitfulness. And then he puts man in the middle of this garden, this ultimate picture of perfection, and, and if you read in Genesis 1, it says the first words out of God's mouth to this man, this man that he had created in this perfect world was, Adam, I want you to be fruitful. Be fruitful, Adam, and multiply. Well, he, he did. We can see Adam being physically fruitful and multiplying and, 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 and people start to cover the earth, but then... It went bad and, and, and God had even regretted that he had created mankind and so he floods the earth and he, he saves Noah out of this flood. Noah, one family. And, and, and Noah comes out of the ark in the very first words that God speaks to Moses and he spoke it three times. If you want to read in Genesis 9, he said, Moses, be fruitful. Be fruitful, Moses. And multiply. And, 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 and that started to happen. But then we see the Tower of Babel and people wanting to be God again. So he confuses their language and God pulls Abraham as his special chosen child. And he starts giving Abraham this promise, this covenant. And he even changes his name and relationship to this covenant. And in Genesis 17, God changes the name from Abram to Abraham. And he tells Abraham, you know what, Abraham? I'm going to make you exceedingly fruitful. And I want you to go and multiply. And then Isaac, Isaac gets the same covenant promise and God said, Isaac is going to be a fruitful vine for the Lord. And so we get this picture that through from the very beginning of time, God has wanted his people, his chosen people to be fruitful. And the prophets started to share this analogy that Israel would be like a vine. In fact, Isaiah said Israel is a choice vine. And Ezekiel said Israel is, is like the vine of the Lord. And, and Hosea even said Israel is like a luxurious vine. And God's desire was that the children of Israel would spread like a vine all over the earth to bring God glory and to share his name so that the world could know about God because of this one chosen family and this family that would be fruitful. And by Exodus 1, the, the children of Israel listened to God's command. They were very fruitful. There were millions of them. And, and by the time of the Exodus, most commentators believe that there were between three and five million Israelites that crossed the Red Sea. They were fruitful and they multiplied. But it didn't work out so great. It didn't work out so perfect. Israel was not as any human family would have been. They weren't a perfect family. And they didn't always reflect and they weren't always faithful to the Lord. And, and Jeremiah, listen to the way Jeremiah put it. He's a prophet speaking of the nation of Israel when they would reject God. It said, I planted you as a choice vine, perfect, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate? How have you become a wild vine? 
And so Israel did not do the job that they needed to to be God's very mouthpiece to the world. And then we have this time, hundreds of years, that's called between the Testaments, between the Old and New Testaments, where it's just quiet. And there's no prophets. And there's nothing going on. And the children of Israel are basically just kind of sitting. But then at the Bible says at just the right time, God sent his son. He sent his son Jesus, the God-man, sent to earth. We hear of his story in, 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 at Christmas time. We talk about his, his birth, his humble birth, God becoming man, Emmanuel dwelling among us. And he lives this perfect life and he teaches people and he, and he has this group of followers, his disciples. And they follow him around for three years, listening to him. But he knows he's going to be betrayed. And on the night before he's getting ready to die, Jesus speaks some incredible words to his disciples. First of all, they went into an upper room. They had what's called the Last Supper. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And then between the upper room in Jerusalem, and you can walk this path today, between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus weeps tears and, and, and his sweat is like blood. But between those two places, he takes a walk with his disciples. And, and right along that path is a huge wall. And I had a very good friend of mine that walked this wall. And she said, if you walk this wall between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, there's vines, that crawling vines that, that climb up this wall. And, and the last thing that Jesus says as he's making his exit from this world his final statement, sort of his deathbed proclamation to his disciples. And I can just see him walking along this wall and grabbing some vines and some branches. And, and Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser or the gardener. And he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he's going to take it away from the ground. He's going to lift it up. And, and every branch that does bear fruit, he's going to prune it. He's going to prune it so that it can even be more fruitful. And, and, and he said, you are already clean. Do you remember when I washed your feet? He's gonna, he said, you are already clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. And then Jesus told his disciples, his followers, he said, abide in me and I in you. As a branch can clearly not bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide or connect with me. And then Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he said, he is the one that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, today we are going to look at the picture of church that's based in the vineyard because God is the gardener and Jesus is the source, the true vine, and we are a bunch of branches. Let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we are so thankful. We thank, we thank you, God, today that just at the right time, Father, you sent your son, Jesus. You sent him to come to this earth to live a perfect life, sinless, but then to die an atoning death, sacrificing, giving of your very life so that we could have life. And we praise you, Jesus, for your willingness to come to be obedient to your Father. And God, I want to pray now that we would have an understanding of how we are to relate to one another based upon this picture, this picture from horticulture of vines and branches. God, I pray that you would touch each of our hearts. Many of us have heard this text many times, but God, speak it to us this morning in a new way. May your Holy Spirit confirm some things to us, convincing us of what we need to do in response as a bunch of branches connected to the true vine of your son, Jesus. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that you would speak to us, that you would lead and guide this time. Again, we are so thankful for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at this morning how we can abide 
together. How we can connect to the vine of Jesus together and how does that bring God glory? Okay, so let's start by defining a word. Let's just define that word abide. That word abide is, is written 10 times in the first 10 verses of John 15. This whole text comes from John 15, but let's define this word of abide. Greek word meno, here's what it means. If you are to abide, it means to stay in a given place, to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be present, or to remain. If you have your sermon notes, you can certainly fill this in. This is the definition, the heart of what it means to stay connected. Now, very clearly, every one of us is abiding in this room. You're all in this room. You're all here. You are abiding here. You're dwelling in this room. Jesus was saying, as you dwell in any given place, dwell, abide, remain in me. It's a picture of connection. A vine a, a branch is abiding in the vine. It is connected to the vine. And he's saying, if you're there, stay there. If you're connected to the vine of Jesus Christ through faith in what he did for you, then stay there. Don't wander. We sang that song, Come Thou Fount. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. There's a part of our heart and our flesh that will want to wander away at times. And, and, and the prayer is, and, and Jesus' command was, stay connected, stay very close, stay in me as a branch would stay connected to the vine. It's a word that speaks of who I am. Please listen to this. This is, can get a little tricky. It speaks as much of who I am as what I do. It's as much a, a, a verb of being as it is a verb of doing. Abiding is who I am. I am connected to Christ as much as what I do. Now many times what I do can build that connection but it can't define it totally. So let's look at three different aspects to abiding. Three ways that we abide. How do we do abiding or three things we abide in. This comes from John 15, the first 10 verses. I'll give you the verse for each one of these. Number one, we abide in Jesus. We abide in the person of Jesus. This is from verse four. Many times when we think of abiding, we think religion. This is so non-religious. This is not about what you do. This is about connecting to a real person. A real person. You know, we know how we interact with each other. Do we interact with Jesus that way? Do we interact with Christ? Do we abide in him as a real person? Because he is a real person. He's a real person with a personality that wants to connect with us. Verse four tells us we abide in him, in Christ. Second thing, his words then abide in us. So now we take, that's from verse seven. His word, God's word, abides in us. How does God's word abide in us? Well, I'll tell you how it doesn't abide in us. It doesn't abide us because we read it, check it off our list, and move on. That's reading his words. That's not allowing his words to abide in us. Two words, I think, that define his words abiding in us. They both start with M. Memorization and meditation memorization and meditation. When you start memorizing God's word and then meditating on God's word, it will move you from reading the Bible to his words abiding in you. Because for his words to abide in, I can't just read it and move on. It has to make its way into my head and make its way into my heart. Second way we abide is when his words abide in us. Third way, number three, we abide in his love. We abide in his love. How do we do that? One word, obedience. The third aspect of abiding is all about obeying what Christ commanded us. So we can't say I'm abiding in Jesus and disobeying him at the same time. That doesn't work. The three aspects to abide in, when we do this, when we abide in the person of Jesus through praise and prayer and just thinking on God, and then we, his words abide in us through meditation and memorization, and then we abide in his love by obeying what he commanded us, we are abiding. We're abiding in the full, true vine of Jesus Christ. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to look at, that's kind of the basics of abiding. Now I want to look at what happens when we abide, when we connect to the true vine of Jesus when we do that together. We're going to talk this morning about the three results of abiding together. What will happen when people connect to Jesus individually and then we connect to each other corporately? What's going to happen? Let's read verses four and five. John 15, verses four and five. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now I want you to notice something up here. First of all, look at in verse 4, it says branch. That's singular. Then it says bear fruit. That also sounds singular. Now let's read verse 5. See if there's a change that happens in verse 5. Verse 5 said, I am the vine, you are the what? Branches. That's no longer singular, now it's plural. And he says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears what? Much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. I used to think verse 5 was for me. Verse 5 is not for me. Verse 4 is for me. Individually, if I connect to the vine of Jesus, my life can bear fruit. In fact, my life will bear fruit when I connect to the vine of Jesus. What's spiritual fruit? I'm not going to take a long time on this. Spiritual fruit is twofold. One, it's the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Fruits of the Spirit are Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Galatians 5.22. Then fruit externally are the good works, the things that I do that bring God glory. So that's fruitfulness. But now look at this. Verse 4 tells me if I connect to Jesus, if I spend time connecting in those three ways, my life will be fruitful. I will have an impact on the kingdom. But verse 5 is not for me alone. Verse 5 is for me and all of us corporately because he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. But now look at what happens to the fruit when we abide corporately. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. I, I love that word much. It's the Greek word polos. Here's what it means. Abundance of fruit. An abundance more than enough. You know, if we want to live lives of much fruitfulness, much impact for the kingdom, it happens when we abide in the vine of Jesus individually and then we connect to one another corporately. I shared this last week. We are one of the most independent cultures that has ever graced this planet. We are independent. We like our space. We like our stuff. We like our world. We'll have communication, but we rarely have deep connection. God is saying, just like those Lego bricks that are stacked so closely together, we are like a bunch of branches that are all connected together to the vine of Jesus. And to bear much fruit, we have to connect with each other. Now look at the result of this, verse 8. Skip down to verse 8. Here's the final result of abiding together. By this is my Father glorified, so that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. When we abide together, we bear much fruit. When we bear much fruit, God is glorified. God gets maximum glory when we connect together. I'm an independent guy. I'm a fairly self-centered guy at times. I can be prideful a lot. You know that, I've shared that before. I don't like the fact that to, my flesh doesn't like the fact that for me to bear much fruit in my life, I need someone else. But I do. I need you. And here's the cool part. To bear much fruit, you need me. And we need each other. Now there's a part of me that, that sort of struggles with that because I'm independent and I feel a little bit capable. God humbles me. I have children, God humbles me. But I feel independent and I feel capable and I feel like I want to be in charge of my own destiny. Anybody relate to that? Be in charge of my own destiny. I'm an independent man. I'm my own guy. Well, you know what? In abiding, I don't get to be independent. And I'm not fully in charge of my own destiny. I need you. So let me be the first to say I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. Because if we are going to bring God maximum glory and we're going to bear fruit for the kingdom, then I have a responsibility to you and you have a responsibility to me to connect to Jesus and not avoid each other. We have a responsibility in that because we want to bear much fruit. So what's the result? God's glorified when we abide together. Our God is glorified when we abide together. Let's skip down to verse 11. Let's see the second result of this. Result number two, John 15, 11. I think you're going to like this one a little better. 
These things I have spoken to you, that my joy, Jesus says, may be in you, and your joy may be full. Jesus spoke of abiding together because he wants to give you his joy. Now, I wasn't around when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, but I have to believe he was the most joyful man ever. Don't you think Jesus reflected that part, that fruit of the Spirit, better than anybody? God becoming man? Jesus was the most joyful person of all time, and he's saying, I want that joy to be in you. But I don't just want it to be in you. I don't want you to just have a little bit of joy. I want your joy to be what? Last word. Full. Let's define these two words. First of all, what's joy? Joy is this. Cheerfulness, gladness. Man, we've talked about this before. Or calm delight. That sounds like a flavor at Cold Stone. <laughs> calm delight, right? Doesn't that sound good? How many of you could use a little calm delight in your life? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> That's a double sin in church. <laughs> calm delight that, that my being, that my very soul is at peace with itself. But it's not only at peace, there's a delight in that. It's like, oh, oh, right? Calm delight. That's, God wants to give you his version of that, which is beyond anything that this world could give to us. Let's look at the word full. How much of it does he want to give? Here's the word full, to complete, to satisfy. Look at this picture word that he gives us, word picture. Literally, to cram a net full. He wants to cram your net full of calm delight. He wants to give you an overabundance of cheerfulness and real joy. But it can't happen until you start abiding in the vine and you start connecting with your brothers and sisters. That's when, if, if you're lacking calm delight, connect to Jesus and connect to each other. How does that happen? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the mystery of that. I don't know how all of a sudden if I connect with Jesus and we start connecting together, joy flows, but it does. It happens. And we can have that fullness of joy, but many times our culture, see our culture, we don't get fullness of joy because we're so independent. We want to connect with Jesus because that new spirit inside us desires that. But we avoid this because our culture says, be your own person, be in charge of your own destiny, live your own life, don't let any connect or intersect with anybody else. So we miss the fullness of joy many times because of our independence. But we can, we, we, we can, we can get that. Second result, here's the second result of abiding together. Our joy is full when we abide together. Church should be a joyful place. Okay, hold on. Say amen after. Church should be a joyful place. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hallelujah. It should be seen. It should be felt. It should be experienced. Does that mean when we do all of these things, when we abide together, does that mean everything is going to go our way? Yes, it does. Everything is going to go your... No, that's not true. Does it mean we're going to have the perfect, perfect health? Does it mean we're going to have perfect finances? Does it mean we're going to have perfect kids? Does it mean we're going to have a perfect church? Does it mean we're going to have perfect pastors? No. No. No way. If I haven't disappointed you yet, I will. If we haven't disappointed you yet, we will. If life hasn't disappointed you yet, it will. Are we going to have perfect relationships with everybody? No. Are we going to have per the perfect face, the perfect body? No. Are we going to have the perfect house? No. Are we going to have the perfect little garden out there to minister? No, we're not. No, it's not going to be perfect. We have true joy because we individually connect with Jesus and then we corporately connect with each other. That is the recipe. That is how we experience true joy. Not because everything in life goes great, because it doesn't. We get joy. We get calm delight. In fact, we get more than enough calm delight when we connect with Jesus and we connect with each other. Let's skip to verse 12. 
Verse 12, we'll get, this is the final result of abiding together. God's glorified. We get fullness of joy. Now let's read verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. I love verse 12. You know, in, in verses 1 through 10, Jesus used the word abide how many times? Do you remember? Ten times. Ten times in the first ten verses he uses the word abide. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about a new commandment. He, he talks about abide ten times and then he says Here's my commandment. I think in some ways he was saying, let me give you the new 10. I know you know the old 10, but let me give you the new 10. And I can define the new 10 in one word. It's the word abide. I can give you the new 10. I can give you the fulfillment of the law based upon the new 10, which is all wrapped up in this picture of connection, abiding in the true vine. And then he says, what is it? He says, this is my new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, he's gonna show us what that looks like. Greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. You know, Jesus spoke these, he spoke these words hours before he would hang on a cross. I mean, hours before he would fulfill that verse, he spoke it to them. He said, you don't realize this yet, but I am going to show you the greatest picture of love because I'm going to take your sin upon myself. I'm going to lay down my life for you. I'm going to give my life, even though I didn't sin once, for all of you bunch of branches. I'm going to give my life so that you can have life. Greater love has no one than this. He showed us how to fulfill the commandment that he gave. He showed us by his life that if you want to fulfill the, the new 10, abide in me, connect to each other, and then love. Lay down your life. Verse 17 brings it all together. Final verse this morning. Jesus said, these things I command you so that you will love one another. He said, I'm going to show you what to do. I'm, my life is going to be an example of the greatest love that has ever been shown on this earth. And now I want you to do that for each other. Now I want you to sacrifice. Here's the final result. We love sacrificially when we abide together. We will love sacrificially when we abide together to the true vine and we connect to each other. True sacrifice. Jesus showed us true sacrifice. True love is not true agape until it costs us something. True love is not God's love until there is a cost associated with that love. Now I gotta tell you that I've seen that love here at Bayside. I have seen and felt and experienced that love from many of you in this room to myself and to my family. We've seen that. I have seen and experienced and felt love that I know cost you something. I've seen that. And as I look around the room, my mind is racing with examples of that. I've also seen that love that costs you something that you've displayed to other people in this body. I've seen that. I've witnessed that. And I just want to tell you at every level, that is awesome. It is an amazing picture when God's people begin to sacrifice for one another. When they count the cost, but they give it anyway. When they say, you know what, I'm going to do this even though it costs me something. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm willing to pay the cost for my brothers and my sisters. And that can only happen, I believe, when we connect to the vine of Jesus and we start connecting to each other in the body. That is the only time and the way that that happens. 
But when it does, it's incredible. I, I wrote down five ways that I've seen this. How do we practically do agape love? How do we really practically, I got five ways that I've seen it, I've felt it, I've experienced it, and I've seen it amongst us. How do we do agape love? Number one, we sacrifice our time. I have seen people in this body give of their time when I know they could be doing something else. And I know the other thing that they could be doing would be more self-satisfying, more gratifying, more fun, more relaxing. I, I, I know that. But when I see people sacrificing, giving of their time, it's costing them time. We are such a busy society right now that sometimes our time is our greatest asset and we guard it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But when somebody gives of that precious time, that guarded time for somebody else in the body, that is love. That is true agape. Second thing, we offer our skills. We offer our skills. You know, there are people in this, in this body who have incredible skills and gifts from God. And, and I have seen many of you, many of you give of your skills for other people. You do things from Monday to Friday that get you incredible skill in these certain areas. And then you say, you know what, but on a Saturday, I'm going to offer that skill to my brother or my sister. I'm going to offer that. I'm going to be a blessing to them because you know what, I have that skill and I know Mark doesn't have that skill. We all have different skills and when we offer those skills up, as an offering and as a sacrifice, and we know it costs us something, God loves it. He's glorified and love starts flowing. Third thing, we distribute our money. Luckily, no one here at Bayside holds their money very tightly, so I don't have to go into this one at length because we love our money, don't we? Well, we like our money. We all do. Our culture tells us to do that. But I have seen you, many of you in this room, start distributing your money, your hard-earned dollars. I mean, I know how hard many of you work. I know how hard you've worked for the money that you have. But when we start to distribute that money, when we start to give that money, when we say, you know what, I have a little more and I could give to this person who maybe doesn't have enough, that's love. It's awesome. And, 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 and it's a beautiful picture of sacrifice and cost. Number four, this one is a little more subtle. We focus our thoughts. We focus our thoughts. I think many times true agape sacrificial love starts when we simply start to think about other people in the body. See, we're like this. Human nature is this. This, this is me. This is my, this is the vine. This is the branch of Mark. I like to focus on this branch. I like to think about this branch. I like to make sure this branch has what it needs. And branches are funny. They are naturally rogue and selfish, grapevine branches. If a branch is not pruned, it will naturally seek the sun and it will seek all the nourishment for itself. Grapevines are naturally rogue and they're naturally selfish. And, and so that's my nature. So I understand that. But, but this branch will naturally want to think about me. But you know what? I'm, I'm also connected to to this branch over here. And many times for me to start to sacrifice for this branch, I have to get my mind off of this branch. I have to start thinking about others in this body. And, and, and when I focus my thoughts on other people, many times it allows me to start sacrificially giving to them. Okay, fifth one, final one. This one kind of encompasses all of them. We share our heart. We share our heart. We actually give our very selves the compassion that we have for another person. We weep when somebody weeps. We laugh when somebody laughs. We rejoice when somebody rejoices. We hurt when somebody hurts. We give our very heart. We share it with other people in the body. You know, sacrificial love only happens when we connect to Jesus and we connect to each other. Here's the three amazing results. The amazing results. Number one, God is glorified. He loves it. That should be enough for us. But God is glorified when we connect together. Number two, our joy is full. 
I, I know we could all use a little calm delight. And, and we'd probably like not just a little, but maybe if our net was crammed so full, there was some overflowing. Our third result is that we can start sacrificially loving each other when we do. You know, I think sacrificial love and God's glory is the ultimate heart of when Jesus started talking about the vine and the branches. He wasn't just giving us a cool analogy because he was walking along a wall. He was saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. Now I want you to do that for your brothers and sisters. Jesus said, I am the true vine and you are a bunch of branches. And my father is the gardener. Every branch that remains in me and I in him, he is the branch that will bear much fruit. He said, I've spoken these things to you so that my joy might be in you and so that your joy might be joy to the full. And he said, greater love has no one than this. Then he lay down his very life for his friends. And he said, these things I have commanded you that you may love one another. Jesus, our true vine, we're a bunch of branches. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do come to you and again, we are so thankful. We are thankful that you sent your son to be that sacrifice for us. You gave your very self, you gave Jesus, your one and only beloved son, that we might have life. In Christ, we thank you that you were obedient to your father. You were obedient to him to come. And you gave your life that we might now have life. And we praise you for the hope that we have, that deep-seated hope because of the good news of what you did. And Father, then you connected us to your son, Jesus. And Christ, we love being connected to you. We love having a source for all of those amazing fruits of the Spirit. But we're not a single branch. And, and Jesus, you also connected us together. And I pray, God, that we would learn, we would see how good it is for you, how good it is for us when, when we sacrificially give for our brothers and for our sisters because we're one. We are a spiritual house, temple being built up, and we are a bunch of branches connected to the true vine of your son, Jesus. We praise you, we thank you, we do worship you in this time, and we pray that you would receive glory from how we interact and relate to one another. Thank you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I love the picture from the inside out. That's the work of abiding. That's the work that God starts to change us, mold us from the inside. So even some of those desires begin to become his desires rather than our own. And when we start connecting and abiding in Jesus as the true vine, he will do the work of changing us. Changing us from in here, those areas that we just can't change ourselves. But he's in the business of that. I want to invite you to two things. Number one, come on down afterwards. Um, get your Lego on the Lego house. Okay, this building is not done. So if you weren't here last week, even if it's your first time, if you're part of the body of Christ, that spiritual temple, come on forward. Let's build this thing up. Second thing is, if you want to come and pray, Join us right in the front for a time of prayer. Um, and whatever that prayer need may be, join us in that. I guess I got three. You get a bonus today. If you're newer, newer, we got something called Bayside 101. And what that is is just a short little tour. You can ask some questions about Bayside. Head right out to the back. You'll see the Bayside 101 sign. And they'll be right back there ready to just kind of walk you around the building and answer any questions that you may have. Sound good? Let's abide in the vine of Jesus. Let's connect together. Let's bear fruit. Let's bring God glory. Amen? Amen. God bless. Have a good week.